Thanks for coming in today. Tell us a bit about yourself. Three options ahead of me. Okay, how about let's just go with option one. I've been building up to this moment for the last four years. We only advertised a job last week. I'm really looking for leadership positions as part of that portfolio. Do you even know what job you're applying for? That will make me a very appealing candidate with a clear value proposition. What? is your value proposition. Out of my 66 scholarly works, oh, now that makes sense. You're a scientist. No one can avoid job interviews. Some companies are doing up to nine rounds of interviews for a single job that the applicant didn't even get. If it's your first time here, my name is Jack and I'm a scientist. I started applying for jobs right after my PhD, but after 50 dead end applications with zero callbacks, something was obviously wrong. It took me 10 years to figure this out. And once I did, my career took off. In 2020, I was named the Australian University Teacher of the Year. I was missing something very simple and obvious, but more on that later on. Turns out it's not just me. Scientists in general are pretty bad at job interviews. Today, let's talk through five lessons I learned about job interviews, starting with lesson five, the cost of hierarchy. Imagine there is a hypothetical research group, the number one lab in the world on culturing lab grower meat. The media wants to interview someone from this lab to talk about the breakthroughs in making synthetic burgers. Who gets that opportunity? There's the head of the research group, a principal investigator or PI who's on every research article and controls all of the research dollars. There are postdocs, scientists with PhDs who are getting paid by the PI. There are PhD and master students being supervised by the postdocs. And then there are undergrad volunteers doing something like a summer research project. Of course, the PI will get that opportunity to talk to the media 10 out of 10 times because like many traditional organizations, scientists operate in a very hierarchical system. Everyone reports to an immediate supervisor who knows incrementally more than you and skipping the line ignoring the chain of command would be unthinkable. Our experiments and results get approved by our immediate supervisor who then gets it vetted by their supervisor's supervisor. And the flow of information is very tightly controlled. If you're working on a new drug to treat cancer or a new vaccine, scientists are incentivized to shut up and not talk about our work unless we're absolutely certain that the breakthrough is real and genuine. So throughout most of our training, we are not talking to that many people that consistently. What do you think is gonna happen? or we go and interview for a job in a different place. Do you think this culture of hierarchy and secrecy lends itself to train people to be charismatic in job interview settings? This is a challenge to those of us who are supervisors or mentors on our organizational charts. How can we foster opportunities for junior staff to be heard? How do we facilitate public speaking opportunities for more people? Can they help manage your social media channels or lead stakeholder engagement events? If we can't blame the players, blame the game and it's time to change the rules. Lesson four the smartest person in the room. If you're elected, how will you address this existential crisis? Presidential candidates are asked these types of questions all the time during election season. And the temptation is to dive into the weeds, to show you know all the facts and figures because you're the smartest person in the room. You wanna know a not so well hidden secret? No one likes feeling dumb. And by signaling you are the smartest person in the room, you start alienating everyone else around you. It turns out a scientist is almost always the smartest person in every room unless of course they're in a room of other scientists. The process of intellectual debate that pushes the field forward doesn't translate very well in a job interview setting. It comes across as argumentative, defensive, and that gut instinct where we know we're right because that's what the evidence suggests just comes across as arrogance or worse, indifference. The truth is there is no correct answer for any job interview question. It's about how you would figure these problems out with the resources at hand and who you would choose to work with. A long tenured hiring VP at Microsoft's favorite interview question that makes or breaks job candidates is this. Tell me what you've learned in the last couple of days. Not how do you solve this crisis, just walk me through the process of learning something new, being open and receptive to change. It reveals a lot about a person when they're not afraid to ask for help because they know they don't have all the answers and demonstrates the quiet confidence of a leader rather than the insecurities that come along with inexperience. Lesson three, mix it up. There are many types of communication skills, written, verbal, nonverbal, and each type of communication needs to be adapted to different audiences. Not to mention online versus in-person delivery as well. Most people don't have well-rounded communication skills. They focus on one more than the others. Let's say you work from home. Your day is dominated by written communication via email. Your success doesn't really hinge on verbal face-to-face -face communication. If you work in retail though, Verbal and non-verbal skills are essential to making the customers feel comfortable enough to ask you for advice and to make a sale. Written communication then 
force to the wayside. What about in science? The only thing that matters for large stretches of most people's scientific careers is how well you've written your grant applications, your research articles, your track record or CV and resume. Does it matter if you make people feel at ease when they meet you in person? No. Numbers don't lie. And if you're productive in science through your written work, you have enormous leverage in our field. But that is a very small minority of scientists whose research is so undeniable that the other skills fall to the wayside. The rest of us, we need more skills in our toolkit. We need to mix it up. A job interview panel is typically made up of managers, supervisors, HR, and you need to make everyone in the room feel comfortable. It's your verbal and non-verbal communication that will take the lead in this setting. Look, how do you develop these other types of communication? If you can't do it as part of your day job, seek out opportunities in extracurricular activities. Go work at a bar, a restaurant, or retail. Volunteer to work at a voting booth on election day. Talk to strangers all day long because you need the reps. I've taught over 100,000 college students and had to find ways to relate to so many different people. That relational empathy is what will serve you well, not just in the job interview, but also to help you build the professional networks that will take you to the next level. Lesson two, sweat the small things, or maybe not. At our core, most scientists I know are skeptics. We're the first to read the fine print, spot the fly in the ointment, find the flaw in the data, because our job is to design experiments that control for everything that could go wrong beforehand. We need to care deeply about the small things. This goes against the entire vibe of most job interviews, which is to focus on the intangibles, that ineffable sense of fit, your take on the big picture. Tell us about yourself. Don't just repeat everything in your cover letter. Tell us something that's not on the page. What's your proudest achievement and why? Not a top 10, just pick one. Does that single achievement reflect your values? Did you uplift other people as part of your own success? Where do you see yourself in five years? Simplifying complex ideas down to one big idea is not easy. The last book you read, What's the main takeaway? The last research article you wrote or read, how will it be reported on the nightly news? Keyword searches on YouTube or Google can help you reframe your idea using words people are already searching for. To translate the small details we care so much about as scientists into big ideas that impact everyone. And last but not least, wait, I almost forgot. The simple and obvious mistake I was making 10 years ago that led to zero callbacks on 50 job applications. I write a lot about that period of struggle and what I learned on my weekly Substack newsletter, crossover connections with Jack Wayne and my podcast of the same name. What I needed to learn was lesson one, self-awareness. According to a VP of hiring at Google, the number one skill they look for in job applicants is self-awareness. Apparently 95% of people think they're self-aware when in fact only 10 to 15% of people actually are. Starting every sentence with I, not being able to answer, what are your strengths and weaknesses honestly? The only way to develop self-awareness is to reflect consistently and constantly. What can you do really well? What are your natural capabilities? What would you like to learn next? What have you learned in the last couple of days? I figured out that it was really weird for recruiters to see my CV in Nepal 10 years ago. A 25 year old scientist with three degrees, a PhD, who's looking for work outside of science. Does he know what he actually wants to do? Will he stick around long enough? Once I figured out that I was strangely overqualified for most of the jobs I was applying for, my strategy shifted. I applied for jobs with a clearer connection to my past experiences, and also I needed to explain in my cover letter during the interview how my skills as a scientist, analytical, complex reasoning, looking at big data, translated into any professional environment. Once I unlocked that piece of the puzzle, I was offered every job that I interviewed for, including the one I'm in now. It all came down to self-awareness. A big part of self-awareness is how we respond to failure, which is something scientists are uniquely qualified to do. You can watch that video about the ways science can teach us about failure here when it's ready to go. I'm Jack, thanks for watching. Hope to connect with you again next time around.